we're talking about 79 and 80. The very first microprocessor that was put into a PC was the 8088 microprocessor. Okay? That was put out by Intel. And that was the very first PC that ever hit the market. Uh, to be precise, very first IBM type PC. IBM happened to produce it. All of the computers we're using today, all the PCs, not Macs, but PCs that we're using today are all essentially uh, what, we would, what we used to call IBM compatibles. We don't even use that term anymore because IBM doesn't even make PCs anymore. But IBM started the ball rolling. Uh, in a very strange way, it started the ball rolling. But Intel made this first 8088 microprocessor. Interestingly enough, a chip that was made before the 8088, the 8086, came out after that. Intel put out the 8088 and put it uh, and, and used it itself and other computers started to come out of that, other brands started coming out of that. But IBM wanted its own specific design, so it used the 8086, which was earlier, which was an earlier model, but um, uh, they just decided to use it so they could have their own line, their own very specific line. Didn't work at all, it flopped. Anyway, after that, we had what was known as the 8286, and typically we only called it 286. And then after that, we had the 8386, and again, we only called it 386. All right, now, before moving on, along with the model of the central processing unit, we have another uh, uh, factor in processors, and that's the speed. Anybody uh, know how, what the speed is measured in, in processors? No? Megahertz? Very good. He says megahertz, or the term hertz, not the rental car, but hertz means cycles per second. Cycles I'm off the screen. Cy cycles per second. Cycles per second. Okay, so hertz means cycles per second. So if mega hertz means cycles per second, megahertz means millions of cycles per second. All right. The 8088 processor, the very first speed it had was 4.77 megahertz. 4.77 megahertz. That means that every second that central processing unit was being read 4,770,000 times. Sure sounds like a lot, doesn't it? Well remember, it's not reading the entire chip. It's not reading one character at a time. It's reading one bit at a time. So it goes through, it reads an on switch. Goes through, it reads an off switch. Goes through, it reads another off switch. So it has to move pretty quick in order to get the data moving. All right? So that's what's happening inside there. From there, we moved up to, I think, uh, 7.5 megahertz. Uh, then we went up to 10 megahertz, and uh, on and on and on we went. From the processor side, or the model side, we went up to the 486, and then we had a 586, but we had a bit of a change there. It was around that time where other manufacturers started coming out with microprocessors. And they were calling their processors 386, 486, and now 586. Even though they weren't made by Intel, they were coming up with their own processors that were compatible and can be used, could be used on the same motherboards and with the same software. Well, with the 586, Intel didn't like that at all. So they filed a lawsuit and said, 586 is our trademark name. The court said, no, can't do that. Can't trademark a number. So Intel said, fine, we'll give it a name. What name did they give it? Pentium. They gave it the name Pentium. All right. All the other manufacturers stuck with 586 because Pentium was a trademark name. And um, other manufacturers then started calling theirs other names. And the 586 and so on line kind of died. But we're sticking with the Intel ones now because they're, they're the biggest ones out there and they've been doing it longer and it's just easier. 
All right, after the Pentium, we had Pentium. This, uh, they called it the Pentium, although it was the Pentium 1 based on what we have now. Then we had Pentium 2. Then we had Pentium 3. And the last one we've got is Pentium 4. Now, here's an interesting thing. Oh, let me go oh, over to the speeds. We increased in speed, and I think it was around in this area somewhere, I forget where, where we actually hit one gigahertz speed. Now, what's the maximum speed anybody's heard of right now? Anybody know? Say again. 2.6? No, much higher than that. No, 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 I, I thought the highest one, I could be wrong, but I think the highest one I've heard about is 3.8 gigahertz. Does anybody know for sure they've heard more than that? Pardon me? No, <laughs> no don't, don't do that. It's not that important. Remember, the information is going to change anyway. Um, so that's about the highest I've heard. Anyway, in this period of time, we had tremendous increases in speed. Tremendous increases in speed. In the 90s and early 2000s, speed increases were tremendous. Really, the 90s were a killer for speed. We just couldn't get those processors out fast enough. We were increasing in speed, we're increasing in models, but we've kind of hit a wall. We can't go a lot faster. Anybody know what the problem is for going too fast? Getting too small, going too fast, what? Uh, heat, heat, we'll come back to heat. Heat's a serious problem. All right, what's happened here? We couldn't really improve the speed, so what did we do? Core two. Dual core and quad core. I think there's all, I heard talk about an eight core, but I don't know for sure. Um, so we had a central processing unit, our first one. We had a central processing unit that was a dual core, and then we also now have a quad core. What that means is here was the full central processing unit, here we had two central processing units, and here inside one chip we have four central processing units. The advantage is that we get very good multitasking. So one part of your central processing unit is doing one thing, another part of your central processing unit is doing something else. Uh, it's not the same as dual processors, all right? It's not the same as having two separate microprocessors in your computer. That's where you get into the server end um, or very high-end computers. But dual core and quad core, that sort of thing, it's similar to that. It's kind of toward that direction, but it's still only one chip. And the advantage is multitasking is great. But there is a downside to that. Anybody know what that is? Pardon me? Well, no, well, I know what you're saying, but that's not what I had in mind right now. But what the problem here is, is that we haven't had that kind of speed. You can get a 3.8 gigahertz chip, like on a single core, but on a dual core, I think the highest I've seen is like a 2.8. There may be a 3 now or something. Anybody seen anything on a dual processor chip? And the quad core is going to be even less. Again, these are rand rough numbers, I don't know. But the more you put in there, the slower your speed gets. When the dual core and four cores first came out, we were actually having situations where software wouldn't run because they, the software needed, let's say, a 2.5 gigahertz processor or better. They go out and buy this brand new computer that's a dual core and it's running at 1.6. People think to themselves, well, I got a dual core. I've got each one of them is running 1.6. Doesn't that equal 3.2 gigahertz? No. It means you've got two processors, or equivalent of two, running at 1.6. Some software wasn't even running, yes. Can you get uh, two that go at different speeds? I have not heard of that. I, 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 I don't even see how that would be possible. I guess it would be technically possible, but I've never heard of it. If anybody ever hears about it, let me know. Um, but um, that was the problem. They, were, they thought they were getting a faster computer. And in some cases, dual core and quad core is actually going to slow you down. Okay, not a lot of cases, but some cases. If you're doing nothing but word processing, you're doing one application all the time, somebody tell me what a dual core or a quad core is going to do for you. Nothing. 
Uh, it's actually going to slow you down some because it's not able to run at the fastest possible speed. You can get a single core processor. Okay? So those are things to consider when you're looking at buying a central processing unit. Again, we've hit that wall where we're just not able to get a lot of speed out of it. It's been amazing to me that in the 90s we were seeing speed increase like crazy. I mean, it was every day it was a faster and faster speed. Now, we've come to a dead stop, virtually a dead stop, and we've had to do things like this in order to improve performance. All right, um, going back to uh, the, the size issue on central processing units, or on microprocessors. Um, size has really come about for one specific reason. Anybody got an idea what that is? Smaller sizes has come about for one specific reason. Anybody got an idea what that is? No? Yes? Say again? Uh, well, actually, you're kind of on the right course, but a lot of people think that size, that making integrated circuits and, and um, uh, printed circuit boards smaller is to save space. Wrong. Look at the desktops you've got sitting underneath your desk. They are about the same size as the computer I bought, or I made myself, 28 years ago. And in some cases, they're heavier than that one too. When you open up your computer, you see all this empty space inside and you have a motherboard this big. Oh, wonderful. You have a great big case, a little tiny motherboard, and it has one or two slots on it so you can do very little expansion. There's not much you can do to the motherboard. And um, even the case sometimes will still only have uh, two or three slots for hard drives or, or CDs drives or DVD drives, etc. So the space isn't, the, the, or the, the, the size giving us more room isn't buying us anything. Smaller size in technology has bought us one thing, just like we talked about at the beginning. It bought us speed. Size equates to speed. Here's how. You have a central processing unit, let's say. We'll just say it's that big. Obviously, it's very tiny. And in this central processing unit, we have a billion switches. All right? As we said, an electrical signal goes through there. In this case, we'll say one billion times every second. Okay. So that electrical signal, we'll just stretch this all out and going into the size we've got here, we'll say that that signal has to traverse about three feet. Okay? We'll say it has to traverse about three feet. Well, if we take that central processing unit and shrink it down to about a quarter of this size, what we've done, and the same number of switches, what we've done is made that distance that the electrical signal has to traverse down from three feet to about one foot. So what have we done to the speed of the processor? Tripled it. Size doesn't buy us more room. Okay, fine, in some cases that's the effect. But size, or smaller size, buys us speed. Now, what's the disadvantage? We already said it. Heat. Terrible problem. Heat's a terrible problem. We've got two problems in this thing. Number one, if we've got the same number of electrical impulses traveling through an integrated circuit that's half the size, we've got that heat being compressed in a tighter spot. On top of that, we are increasing from 4.77 megahertz to 3.8 gigahertz, meaning 4.7 million electrical impulses to 3.8 billion electrical impulses traveling through that every second. So we're increasing the speed that way, the increasing the heat that way. So we've got a tremendous amount of heat in there. In the 90s, when we were really cooking, really getting those processors faster and faster and faster, you had to be around there to see what was going on in the 80s and the 90s. We were getting technology so fast, we, there was no time for testing. Companies were putting out processors and putting out chips so fast, they were getting them out there without being tested or very little testing. 
you would buy a computer today because a different one was available tomorrow. They were getting the manufacturers were getting them on the market today because something different was going to be there tomorrow. I was in Silicon Valley at the time and they had production lines going 24 hours a day and when you got off work one day, it's possible your assembly line changed the next day without you knowing about it because technology 